so we think it's you can find out a lot of quirks about someone and kind of like what makes them tick when you see what's on their nightstand so what's on your nightstand right now oh my gosh like five lip balms probably Ah. or at least two lip balms um biosance eye cream that's great botanicals is one of the lip balms as well Mm. and um a vintage alarm clock and some artificial flowers i love that that's a great nice stand that says a lot about you (laughs) it's like you take care of yourself but you have the charm and the chic aspects of I love my clean design. beauty. I think that's what it says. I think that's kind of like how we first bonded with <laughs> clean beauty yes. on a toy set. Um, well, Lauren, thank you so much for coming to the Dilly Dally podcast. We're excited to have you on day one. Uh, so thanks so much for coming out here on this beautiful night. Started off as a windy day, but um, we're yes, excited to have so you here. Yes, it's so cozy. Thank you for having me. So with Dilly Dally, uh, we're starting to talk with you know members of our creative community how they got into creative, you know, their challenges, the ups and the downs, good times, the bad, and um, everything in between. And so, uh, especially since we love working with you and all these Dilly projects, um, we wanted to bring you on and and get your thoughts and opinions and more. Let's do it. So let's kind of go way back when, you know, how did you get started in your creative career? Like tell everyone what you do, how you started, that pathway. So I'm a writer director. I work in narrative and I also work in branded and commercial. And I love working with Dilly when it comes to all of that great branded and commercial stuff. Um, how far back do we start? <laughs> with, well, I mean, hey, how I got your, into this. what's your earliest childhood memory when you're like, I know I'm going to have a creative journey, whether it's a career or a hobby, but you're going to have a creative path. Yeah. So I grew up in the New York City area, so I'm very lucky that I grew up in a part of the country that is very into Broadway and theater. Uh, So I would say it was those early trips into the city to see shows like The Lion King and The Phantom of the Opera, like such a big impact on me as a kid. And um, my dad was a big movie buff, so I grew up watching a lot of classic Hollywood black and white films uh, grew up watching a lot of his favorite movies, which were a lot of Martin Scorsese and Spike Lee films. Mm. So I kind of got this like education on classic Hollywood cinema and New York auteur cinema at a very young age and just thought like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, I have to do this. Did you ever look at films and say like there was a point like or what part of filmmaking you wanted to be involved in? Yeah, it was probably like around the time, uh, 2004, I was 13 years old. I'll just go ahead and date myself. (laughs) Um, And The Aviator was coming out with um, Leonardo DiCaprio. And it was like a very anticipated film. And at the same time, Turner Classic Movies put out a documentary called Scorsese on Scorsese, where he sort of interviewed himself about like his entire life's work movie by movie and watching him talk about each film and what inspired the film and his creative process for putting those those movies together just totally blew my mind Mm -hmm. and I was like this is the coolest job ever I want to do this (laughs) so yeah I was like in middle school and I was like I want to be this old man, Martin Scorsese. Like he's my he's my role model. He's so like, would you would you consider Martin Scorsese to be your role model, or do you have multiple role models? Yeah, I I still count him to be one of my favorite filmmakers. I think he fires on all cylinders when he works, and he really understands how to take a character's emotion and journey and find the visual language for that, um, which I think is at the heart of what what movies can do. And I like to think that I take his approach to stories about women, stories about young people, stories about protagonists that don't necessarily always get that super cinematic auteur treatment, but I think deserve it just as much as the Leonardo DiCaprio characters and the Robert De Niro characters of the world. Yes. So then you went to NYU, right? Yes. Well, that's where Martin Scorsese went to school. Oh. So, and Spike Lee. So I was like, well, these guys went to NYU. This is clearly where you got to go to get it done. So that was, I had like pretty laser focused on Mm -hmm on making that happen. So and what were those NYU days like? We always, I always think about <laughs> NYU kids and their, their education is so different, so unique, and they're in one of the coolest cities of the world at such a young age. So yeah. share that with the audience. 
NYU was awesome. And I also had some friends from high school who went to NYU to study drama and some friends who were studying drama in Juilliard. So that time in my life was just an incredible couple of years where I was just with so many different kinds of artists all day, every day, and taking in so much so much different types of art. You know, I was at museums all the time. I would see a Juilliard rehearsal show and then I would do like back to back Broadway student rush tickets, you know, like I was just really able to consume and explore so many different kinds of art. And it was so wonderful to have those four years of just making mistakes, experimenting, finding my voice and being able to do it in like a safe, supportive, creative environment. Um, where, you know, there's not like a studio or a client kind of breathing down your neck and like, you better do it this way or don't mess that up. You know, I think like it's you so can really experiment and like be true to your own voice and, and like do try and error, trial and error. I can Yeah. Say. It was like such a great gift to have that time to explore and find my voice and, you know, get certain inevitable mistakes out of your system totally. <laughs> in a safe space and not be doing it like on the job in the in a professional setting. So um, I absolutely loved my film school in New York experience and time for that so reason. So how did you end up in LA? I know not, it's not well, <laughs> an abnormal place to end up in your um, profession, but how did, you, how did your journey move you out west? Yeah, so as much as I had an amazing time at NYU and absolutely loved the New York scene. Um, It's the only place I've ever lived. And especially at the time, the environment in New York was very much about independent film and documentary film. And I, as much as I, I love the Martin Scorsese's of the world and all of those types of movies, I was really finding my voice to be uh, a lot more lighthearted, comedic, romantic. I did a romantic comedy as my th- senior thesis, which was like an unheard of choice at NYU. Very much the oddball genre to, to choose as Beat your... your own drum. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I was like doing a Valentine's Day rom-com as my senior thesis mm-hmm. and everyone else was like making these dark, moody, broody... <laughs> Blue Valentine, actually, like Blue Valentine was like a very popular oh, movie at the yes. time. So everyone was kind of thinking about making a film like that or Paul Thomas Anderson's The Master was very, very popular. Um, and I was really attracted to movies like like Pitch Perfect mm-hmm. and Easy A and those kinds of films. So I thought it would be interesting to change it up and explore what the West Coast had to offer and maybe be in an environment where you could tell really a wide variety of stories and and not just kind of do the the dark indie film thing. Um, but I think a lot has changed in New York is actually really blossomed into being a, a place for all kinds of stories. So it's true. They're both great cities. They're really <laughs> yeah. hard. I think in the perfect world, I think everyone would maybe in some ways be by coastal of, of sorts, even if it's, you know, 30% and 70% in the other city. But they both have so much to offer, but they're so different. But I do think everyone should live in both cities at some point in their life if they can. I, I would totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. That's that's ideal. Mm-hmm. Maybe New York when you're <laughs> slightly younger and L.A. when you're slightly older because there's just positives and benefits <laughs> to that. But So your family, uh, let's say someone walks up to your mom or your dad and they're sitting across from that lunch and they're like, hey, what does Lauren do again? <laughs> what do you think they would say? Or one of your sisters? <laughs> Um, they would say that I do all sorts of things, but they would probably circle, you know, in film and video, but they would probably circle back to my, my love for doing, uh, like beauty content and romantic comedy and just really female driven, empowering, lighthearted types of stories, whether that takes the form of a commercial or a narrative piece. We always joke, we're like, how many of our family members actually know, one, what we do, and then two, do, does anyone, even our friends, do we know like, an in and out of what we do? Do we do we know what our parents do? Do we know what our friends do? Actually, really, we don't know. I mean, maybe some more than others, but um, it's always it's fascinating to see like the outside perspective of how people are looking at you. And um, something that comes up here a lot is imposter syndrome, and a lot of times females suffer from it more not to say that males don't suffer from it but especially I think and then being a director and filmmaking um 
there's a there's a lot of like perceptions I'm sure people can shine upon us or or, or I'm at a loss of words <laughs> for today and today but speaking of imposter syndrome like have you ever suffered from it do you have it do you not have it if you <laughs> don't have it then how have you avoided it but if you do have it then how do you overcome it yeah I do I do have it certain times I I think what helps me continue to to overcome it is just being grounded in the work and the experiences that I have had and trusting that that will, you know, see me through any new challenges or new types of work that I take on. So um, I think that, again, it comes back to being fortunate enough to have like a film school experience where I really got to learn the craft and appreciate the process inside and out. And those core principles and values are like really where it's at and continue to serve me Mm -hmm. um in this in this day and age and just looking back on everything that you have accomplished and all of the the film shoots that I have under my belt and being like all right you know I can do this uh I can probably I've I've done you know hundreds and I can probably do the next hundred you can make anything happen (laughs) confidence that makes a difference uh, so we talk a lot about characters and how people like earlier may perceive us one way and then we perceive ourselves a different way. But, um, if you could be a cartoon character, you don't have to say like, oh, I would be Mickey Mouse, but like <laughs> describe your cartoon character. Like what would they wear? Cause you don't, if you're a cartoon, right, you can only have one outfit. So like, what would you wear? How would you behave? What would you be known for? What would be your superpower? Um, <laughs> what would Disney want to, you know, make a gazillion dollars off of you and, I mean, the, the first time. the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is, um, speaking of Disney, the Lizzie McGuire cartoon ah. character. <laughs> so I think I would be um, very quippy and sassy and quirky and wearing, you know, mid 2000s clothes mm-hmm. and just sharing all my little observations about the world. Yeah. <laughs> that would be me as a cartoon character. I can see that. That's great. <laughs> so if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Oh my gosh. Probably to to be able to teleport and travel mm-hmm. travel with no time and money and just see the world. Ta- take take in take in all the stories of of uh the planet and humankind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where would you travel to? Like what are your top 5 places that you would go to? Uh I really want to spend time in South America and Asia mm-hmm. cuz those are just two continents that I haven't gotten a chance to spend really any time in mm-hmm. in my life so those are like top of top of the bucket list I love it. to explore so as we're coming to a close if you were to get on a zoom call with your 18 year old self and she says hey lauren like what advice can you give me what advice would you give to her um my advice would be to Spend time tapping into your own intuition and your own sort of identity, sense of self, kind of all of that inner work to get to know who we are. Because I think, especially when it comes to advice, we spend a lot of time listening to others and relying on the external world to give us advice and tell us where to go. But mm-hmm. but the best advice is probably to tap into your own intuition and, and follow your own advice mm-hmm. instead of other people are conventional wisdom because I think at the end of the day if we're able to tap into that we we know what's best for us mm-hmm. it's true when you can block out the noise it makes all the difference and more and just like stay balanced and stay centered so a few more questions but speaking of balance what are your non-negotiables like what is something like either you do every day every week every month that is a non-negotiable for you no matter what's happening oh that's that's a great question. And it's something I'm like actively thinking about. And and going into this new year, I started putting in some daily like morning meditation and morning journaling. Um, a lot of us artists talk about the morning pages and just doing like three pages of journaling every morning. So uh, at the top of this new year, I've, I've made the journaling and like at least five minute meditation, like a non-negotiable. And I think it's been really great and helpful. And, uh, sure. you know, it's February, we're going strong. So yeah. that's great. <laughs> a great start to the year then. Hopefully it's a, it's a forever thing or I'm sure these practices and non-negotiables, they, 
they continue to evolve and change, but mm-hmm. that's, they that's make where a big I'm difference right in now. your life too. It's like even the small things you can do, and if it's five minutes a day, uh, they really contribute to like a greater success all around. Uh, so if someone's coming up to you and they're like, Hey Lauren, I just landed in LA, just got out of film school. I really want to be a director. Help. I'm lost. <laughs> Tell me what to do. Like, what is the playbook? Is that's, there a playbook? That's a really hard question. <laughs> that's a really hard question. Um, for me, the advice that I got and what it looked like for me was um, to work in the mailroom um, at one of the big agencies. That was kind of the only job I really had the resume and the relationships to, to land. And um, that was a good job. That worked. I think what is more important than the job um, and sort of where you're able to find do the work, whether it's doing freelance work or whether it's being a Hollywood assistant or whether it's being a PA or something like that, whatever you find is your entry level job. It's all good. I think the main thing is to keep making work, keep digging into your directorial writer, director, creative voice and, um, you know, putting out new creative material because that's what's going to develop your voice. And that's, what's going to get people to want to hire you as a director is, Mm -hmm. is seeing that work. So, I would say don't worry too much about the day job and worry more about the the creative, how you can support your creativity and your creative output because mm-hmm. that's that's what's going to make the difference. Yeah, foster that growth. Um, what would you say is the hardest thing about being a director that nobody really thinks about? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think that on a in a sort of moment to moment level, I, I think the most challenging thing is is finding the right words to express what you're looking for, because filmmaking in, in a lot of ways is, is creating something out of nothing. And so putting words or mood boards or images to the, you know, the vision that you have and, and choosing the right words um, that that I find to be like challenging day to day, even when you're working with actors, it's like. I always want to say the least amount of words possible to them to like communicate the idea because there's such a there's such an impulse to over explain or because it's hard to find the right words just say a million things but I think it's more effective if you can mm-hmm. just find how to communicate as concisely as possible mm-hmm. and then p- let other people run with run with that. Um, do you have any advice for somebody about dealing with uh, clients or? Mm. Um, somebody who's trying to strong arm the production (laughs) or just somebody who is trying to get in the in the way of something that you know is going to work out and that you have a vision for yeah that they might not be able to see yet for sure I think that all of the stuff you just described comes from a place of feeling unsafe or uncertain or not quite knowing what's best or what you want and then kind of just spiraling from that place So I think when we as creators or producers, whatever, uh, being confident in our vision and our ability to execute the task at hand and leading with that and and again, like not over explaining it, just being confident and concise in in what that is and kind of setting that confident, in control, safe Mm -hmm. tone and creating that safe space, which I definitely think a director's job, for example, is is in a lot of ways to create a safe environment and a healthy, happy environment where everybody else can do their best work, right? Mm-hmm. It's gonna be it's gonna be wardrobe and really having the best ideas about the clothes. It's gonna be the DP and the gaffer having the best ideas about lights. And I just have to create a space where they can do that. <laughs> um, and I empower them instead of getting in their way. Mm-hmm. Um, so when it comes to just allowing everyone to collaborate effectively, I think it's just setting that confident tone and then also not being too much of a control freak that you're holding on to it and you're white knuckling it, you know, like it's finding that perfect point of strength and flexibility. Um, you know, I love it when people have ideas that are better than mine. I'm like, great, a better idea. Let's do it. Collaborative environment um, <laughs> on set. Uh, you know, and, and in my early days, and it was something I... I think film school was a great space to test that out. Um, You know, we, we write our script and we think it's the Bible and we think it's so precious and we're so 
uh, we can't imagine being flexible with it or letting go of any aspects of it. And I had the experience on my senior thesis film where um, it rained. We were shooting exteriors in New York and it rained. And I was like, no, it's raining. It's not supposed to be raining in the script. It's it's not raining on the page. And, you know, instead of going completely down that road, I was able to say, wait a minute, it's raining. It's magical. Yeah. It looks beautiful. I got a free wet down service that yes. people spend thousands of dollars on. And look, turn that the around. The pavement is glistening and it has such a vibe. And I think the more we're able to like embrace the metaphorical rain and mm-hmm. not fight against it, like we discover wonderful new things and it enhances the, the project even more. So I just always, you know, that was such a valuable like lesson and learning moment that I think continues to apply to almost every single shoot that I uh that I am on that's what it is problem solving all all day in production yeah yeah I've got one more question um so you're talking about a lot a lot about confidence and how important it is to be confident in as a director but also in this just general industry at what point if you did um were you faking that confidence (laughs) And at what point did you realize, oh, I'm not faking anymore. I am confident. And what was that? What made you realize that you were actually, oh, okay, I can, I can actually do this instead of pretending I can do this. Yeah. I mean, I had such a like passionate, strong calling to this work as a teenager. And I was really able to develop it and develop my confidence at a place like NYU and it wasn't something I really struggled with until I came to Los Angeles as a adult or real world person and um maybe because I was a young woman or you know I think sometimes depending on what our identity is people give us certain feedback um that I was calling myself a writer director with confidence and other people were not necessarily reflecting that back Mm. to me they were like no you should be an assistant or no you should just be a writer only or whatever they were they were Mm. trying to kind of put me in their box of what they saw someone like me as and so that really took a hit to my confidence and it took a while to like build it build it back up again uh from there and I think that it's just again, tapping into your own intuition and remembering like who you are and everything you've done and, and defining yourself on your own terms, defining success on your own terms and remembering that like you don't need other people's permission and validation Mm -hmm. to like know your, your worth and your value and what you're capable of. Um, so it's hard because we live in a culture where that external validation counts for a lot <laughs> um, and it gets to us. Um, but as much as possible to just not rely on external things for that confidence and to try to get it from within, I think is is the best strategy to to stay in that place and not get sort of tossed about by society, culture, and, and what other people would have you do. It's hard. I think sometimes someone's perception of you can just become you so easily and you forget who you want to be, who you are at the root and core of yourself. And if you can stick with it, you know, that's worth gold. It's hard. And that's that's where those five minute a day meditations can really yeah. help you get back on track. <laughs> yes. And you're a beauty guru too. I remember we were first talking about clean beauty, but you're a beauty guru. So uh, what is your favorite beauty product? If you have one oh product gosh. that you could recommend to everyone, like what should everyone go and buy? I think for for all of us, if um, experimenting with clean beauty foundation really like completely changed my skin mm-hmm. for the better. Mm-hmm. Getting away from those synthetics, mm-hmm. just like so. What is a I could a Holy I could Grail go on brand. and on. My favorite brand is by a. Um, incredible uh danish woman who's based in new york her name's kirsten care weiss her line is called care weiss and it's a little pricey but it's to me it's like it worth is. every penny skin's your largest organ so take good care of it yeah and it, it just completely transformed my skin when i started using it so i would say go to your clean beauty store and try try some clean beauty foundation and see what your skin does because 
it's I'm, worth I'm it. I'm all about it. <laughs> Love it. Well, Lauren, you've been incredible to have on the Dilly Dally podcast, and we are so grateful to not only have you on this podcast, but be able to work with you on so many fun projects from beauty to cleaning and beyond. So thanks so much for being a great partner, and thanks for coming out tonight to share your amazing stories. And I know a lot of people, especially aspiring directors, are going to be very grateful for oh all the gosh. advice you share. Yes, good luck out there, everybody. Keep yeah. making your work and telling your stories. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, thank, thank you, you Dilly. Lauren. Hey, Lauren, where can we find you after this? Online? Oh, yeah. Um, my website is just my name, laurenchiravalli.com. So it's a long Italian name with lots of vowels. So it'll be, it'll be fun for you Beautiful. to spell, but I bet it's in the show notes somewhere. It'll be in the show notes and it's or my, in the description. It's my Instagram as well. So we'll have all the links you can find so they me with can my come name. find you yep. and Instagram websites and beyond. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren.